Okay, this is our second animal behavior video. I want to check first with your Cornell notes and make sure that where you're at is E. We've done learned behavior, where we talked about associative learning, operant conditioning, classical conditioning. And then number two, the second type of learned behavior, habituation, where you learn to ignore meaningless stimuli. So just want to check in with that and make sure that over here to the left side, you're reading the corresponding parts of chapter 51. So specifically look for habituation and over here to the left in that column, write some examples that you find in the book, maybe other definitions, diagrams, whatever's going to help you repeat the information and understand it better. I also encourage you to get together with some friends, go over the information, teach each other. That will also help your retention level go up. All right, so this um, video is all about social behaviors. How do organisms interact? And they know that these things have advanced because it has given them some sort of an advantage. So in class, we talked about how mutations could be an advantage, and those mutations might cause the expression of a gene for a behavior. These social behaviors allow those organisms in that population to have a greater chance of survival. We're going to talk about five social behaviors. Communication, which could be in many different forms of language. Agonistic, which is like aggressive behavior. A dominance hierarchy. Cooperation and altruism. These are some different animals. A lot of these are acting out agonistic behaviors right here. This one is a prairie dog acting out a very selfless, a very altruistic behavior. All right, so let's start off here with number one. So first we've got communication. Song and language is a really basic form of communication because it allows organisms to talk to each other, have that line of communication, that verbal line. Um, bird species have very specific songs that are species specific. And they, it is an imprinting thing where they need to learn it within a critical amount of time and during a critical period of time. It is both a mixture of a learned behavior and innate. Insects, their um, bird songs are, or not bird songs, their insect songs are completely genetic. They are born knowing their insect species song. All right, another type of communication, um, another type of language is the honeybee dance. Honeybees do what's called the waggle dance. And this man right here, his name is Carl von Frisch. It is a German man. And this might seem silly to you, but this is how I remember it. Um, Carl von Frisch, he is, um, he is the dancing, he's got the dancing pants on. So you think of these little shorts that he wears, and I think of that, I know, lederhosen. So the, this outfit, this is his like dancing outfit, and that's how I remember it. Carl von Frisch um, with the dancing pants, he studied bees. And when he studied the bees, he realized that they do a very specific dance. He calls it the waggle dance when they return to the hive. And the dance does two things. It tells the other bees in the hive the direction of the food and the distance to the food. So in your book, they go through and they show this little dance that the bees do and that it shows both the direction and the distance. So it's another form of communicating important information to the rest of the group. So it's a very social behavior. Um, this is a velvet monkey here, and he is doing an alarm call. Alarm calls could both be considered a form of language and a form of altruistic behavior. It's language because he's certainly communicating that danger is near, and he's sending out a warning to the rest of the monkeys. It's altruistic because it's very selfless. He is actually putting himself in harm's way by shrieking like this because the predator can right away notice him. Here's another type of communication, pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals that animals release. You have pheromones, you have natural smells about you, and those smells might draw other organisms to you or draw organisms away. So you can think of like perfume, perfume and cologne, those are artificial pheromones, artificial smells that we add that might attract others, but whether you realize it or not, you are naturally attracted to the smells of other people. Here is another one. This is um, showing some minnows, 
And if you tap on the glass in the minnow, so this is actually a motion form of communication. If you tap on the glass, they will all cluster together here. So again, all of these ones that we've mentioned are forms of communication, ways that organisms um, speak to each other within a population. All right, number two, agonistic. The word agonistic means aggressive and fighting. It's usually over territory or over a mate. They usually will not fight till someone is harmed or till someone dies. They just fight until someone is submissive. So they're really going for who is boss, who's in charge, who takes on the, if you think of dominance hierarchy, who's going to be the alpha male, who's going to be the top dog. So here are some examples. Snakes, it's really wild. They do this dance, and that is their agonistic behavior. And again, they're waiting for one of them to be dominant and one to be submissive. Dominance hierarchy, this is our third form of social behavior, and it is when a group of organisms forms a ranking, and they rank out, this is the alpha male, and this is who comes next. And you can think of it like wolves. In a wolf pack, there is an alpha male, and there are the rest of the pack. Um, with bees, there is the queen bee, and the worker bees, and the drones. There's different levels within their, um, their social ranking. We sometimes call that their pecking order. All right, number four, cooperation. Cooperation is exactly what it sounds like. It's when organisms in a population work together. So when they work together, it's to achieve some common goal, and they're more likely to survive if they do this work together. So I have two examples here. The first one is this pack of dogs. They're much smaller than the wildebeest here, but they're able to take it down because they all attack at once. And then this one I think is so cool too because I'm sure you've seen this picture, but this is a little more rare for humans to watch. This is a group of pelicans, and they, um, they surround a group of fish, and they actually sort of hone it in and, and, and decrease the size of their hunting area so that they, um, they're able to catch the fish easier. All right, and our fifth and final social behavior is altruism. Altruistic behavior is willing to give of yourself to allow your kin to be selected. Kin is anyone that has the same gene pool as you, so it's allowing your genes to be passed on. There's a scientist called Hamilton, and in your book you'll see that there's Hamilton's rule. Hamilton's rule is basically a mathematical way of figuring out, all right, I will sacrifice myself for my children, or for a brother or sister, or for cousins, but I'm most likely to sacrifice in that order. First kin, then siblings, then cousins. So you have to be part of the same gene pool to be willing to sacrifice is the way that it usually works. And we call that um, kin selection, and it usually reduces your chance of survival. I think of the prairie dogs, and they go out and they have one on watch and they're looking out for the predator and if a predator comes around they shriek and let everybody else know go hide they're putting themselves in danger but they know that the chances of their genes being passed on um, are are in a greater opportunity all right i hope you enjoy this unit this is the shortest unit of the year please look through everything go back through the textbook um, repetition is key, just like you saw in that Cornell Notes thing. Try and think about what could the essays be, how does this relate to the experiment that I'm doing with the pill bugs in class, and please ask me questions at the beginning of class if there's something that you're not understanding.